Mastiffs have always been favoured by noble families and they belonged and seemed to fit well with stately homes. You can still see in some of them their kennels uh, where they kept Mastiff dogs because they were considered noble. They had a statuesque grandeur and a magnanimous nature which some of the lesser types did not possess and demonstrate. If you look at the early prints from folk art right the way through, showing these extraordinarily brave dogs grappling with wild boar and with stag and sometimes with oryx, you begin to get an idea of what the dogs look like and how the hunt was carried out. This was their role, to seize big game and either slow it down or hold it completely still until the mounted or dismounted hunters arrive to dispatch it. Mastiff type dogs don't tear up the flesh, they grip. That was their value to hunters. They slowed down the quarry, they seized and held it. And you hear certain dogs praise because they seize and hold their prey. There was a special form of praise for a brave heavy hound. Before the invention of the firearm, big, strong, strapping heavy hounds were of immense value to man. They could pull down big game which no spear could reach, which no arrow could slow down. They fed primitive man. If you are in a country with wide open spaces and there are big game available to feed your larder, to feed your children, and you have huge, heavy hounds, fast enough, brave enough, ferocious enough in the hunt to pull them down, what a benefit. My own view is that, and because there are so many ancient records in the depiction of them, whether it's in pottery or on carvings and so on, a certain type of dog can be identified. I think 2000 BC is the earliest that these sort of artifacts have been found. And it has been in what used to be called Sumeria and Mesopotamia and that part of the world. According to the, the artifacts from Sumeria and the things that they've bequeathed to us, candle holders, carvings on, on statues and so on, right through uh, to the Assyrian uh, dogs portrayed in the hunting field, Assurbanipal's uh, hounds, show that there was a type of dog like that and valued in, even in those days. We see these images and these friezes or reliefs during the Nineveh periods clearly show a mastiff type head that could even show up in today's uh, modern dog show and probably win points. The Assyrians were big game hunters and they hunted everything from antelope to boar, sometimes lion. If there was big game, they hunted it. And they needed dogs to assist them in the hunt. A domesticated dog that had the power and size of a mastiff was very valuable to these people. The mastiff has always had a utilitarian purpose this enabled the Mastiff to survive to this present day.
the Assyrians learned a great deal from the Sumerians. The Sumerians are widely believed now to have invented the wheel. And the Sumerians have this strong link with steppe people and the Hyrcanians in particular, who come from just south of the Caspian Sea. And remember, Alexander the Great called the Caspian Sea the Hyrcanian Sea. If you then go on to the writings of the ancient Greeks, they refer to the Indian, in inverted commas, dog, because India wasn't the country of today, it was the, the Far East. And they also mention the Hyrcanian dog as being striped like a tiger and being used for boar hunting. The description of that dog by the ancient Greeks is the nearest you get to a hunting mastiff as used subsequently in Europe. But I don't think it's correct to link it with the Molossian dog. The Molossians, who lived in Epirus, which is just in, uh, across on mainland Greece from Corfu, they had two sorts of dogs, a huge flock guardian, rather like the Marema or the Kuvash, and a huge hound, which later became called the Suliot dog, and was used by German regiments, rather as the Irish guards used the Irish wolfhound. I think it's very unwise to link um, directly modern breeds of dog with ancient types of dog. But the ancient types of dog were perpetuated. The Alans were steppe nomads. Their mastery of the horse led them to being utilized by the Romans as cavalry. They were famous for their dogs too. The Roman army in Britain had a force of Alan cavalry of over three and a half thousand. They would have brought their dogs with them. And so Alans with Alans came into Britain uh, 2000 years ago. When dogs come into a country, and those dogs are, are, are admired, they are coveted and they are bred from. That is the Alaunt legacy which we have with us today. The Mastiffs, as we would call them from England, not necessarily looking like the breed today. Heavy-headed, strong-shouldered, active, big, strapping dogs. Britain was famous for them. And there are plenty of references of English dogger or dogs, in the, in the mastiff sense of the use, being rated much more highly in mainland Europe by the big game hunters than any other breed or type. In Old English, nomenclature matters. Dogger, D-O-C-G-A, meant a Mastiff-type dog. And that has lived on in like the Deutsche Dogger, the German Mastiff. Dog de Bordeaux. Dogo Argentina. You can see how that name has gone on. And then the Saxons arrived, the word ban dogger or ban dog was used. It was not to indicate a tied up dog, a dog that was banded. It was indicated a dog that was leashed in the hunt and only let free to pull down the game at a certain stage. And there are records of several hundred band dogs being released in the hunt. So it's hardly an indication of a yard dog. So you go from dog or dogger to ban dog or dogger through to mastiff. When men wanted dogs before, whether they were dogs in what we now call the shooting field, they had to have a certain type to them. Setters had to be able to stand still and indicate unseen game. 
point is the same. Spaniels had to be able to not just flush game, but find it, bring it back. So a different type came, and breeds became refinements of that type. The modern group of mastiffs came because man needed a big game hunter, a dog to pull down game. And so what it, what it gave to the breeds that bear the mastiff name in their title is a dog that could hold and grip and hold fast. Some of the early hunting masters were called hold fast and the, the grip was famous. One of the difficulties of talking about breeds nowadays, there were no dog breeds before the middle of the 19th century. People bred good dog to good dog. Hundreds of years ago, when breed type was not important, it was what the dog did, what it was kept for. It wasn't until the 19th century that, it, that the, the beauty points, if you like, started to be uh, of any importance at all. And even then, as, it was, as they were mostly kept by the nobility, they still probably had to, to run and hunt. I think hunting decided their form. Now those dogs had to have immense determination, immense courage, immense perseverance. And once they had gripped this animal, no matter what the animal did to them, whether it was the stag's horns, the fearsome side tusks of a wild boar, they had to hang on and often gave their lives in that hanging on. That meant they had to be strong-necked, strong-headed, substantial dogs physically, but immensely agile and athletic. If they were slow, if they were not agile, they were killed. Therefore, they couldn't be bred from. From a temperament point of view, it gave them a, if you like, a tremendous will to succeed if you give them a job to do. And if you like, that's a form of faithfulness. They do not give up. They will not surrender the, their master to the fates or to an attacker or to a situation which puts their lives in danger. They are the ultimate protection, if you like. In medieval times, Entertainment with dogs and wild animals was a sad feature of the culture of that time, if you can call it culture. And so lions, bears, badgers, all sorts of animals were baited for public amusement. Any town of any size had a baiting room. It was like this day and age as a football pitch, even behind the village green. Big strapping dogs were used for this. They were called mastiffs because they were big dogs, not because they conformed to a breed. Some were called bulldogs if they were used on bulls, but they shouldn't be confused with the name bulldog as applies to a breed of dog. Bull baiting dogs or bull fighting dogs will be a better expression. None of the bull baiting dogs had short faces and none of the big game hunting dogs have short faces. The short face in, say, the bull mastiff was bred in in order to give the keeper's night dog a mastiff bulldog blend. But there is no depiction that I know of which shows any of the mastiff type dogs, even the smaller ones later called bulldogs, having a short face. Bull baiting came to an end because of the sickening scenes that were seen all over Britain by people calling themselves dog owners or dog breeders. They weren't, they were just vicious pursuers of brutal sports. Mastiffs, I don't think, would have been any good in baiting spectacles because there's no fun in going along and watching a brave dog despite every horn, hoof, or whatever came near it, teeth, 
hanging on to the ear of a bear or the ear of a boar or even the side of a lion. These people who went to these awful spectacles wanted gore. And gore comes from slashing and tearing jaws, which a mastiff does not have. The mastiff temperament, which we now know, has been bred in and is famous and rightly so. And it's a much admired steadfastness and uh, self-control and minimum force, uh, protective, not noisy, uh, all good things in any protector, whether canine or, or whatever. If you look at the Mastiff breeds, and there's a commonality amongst the, the different breeds, they have often the same temperament and approach to life, whether they're smaller or, 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 or whatever. I think the great value is their ability to protect you come hell or high water. The bull mastiff was taken over by the gamekeepers to, uh, to keep poachers off, but I think the mastiff would probably be in the guard round the house. I think poachers would have a problem with the dog with the courage and strength of the night dogs, the mastiff types, and there are very good accounts of the strength and uh, determination of uh, dogs when the poachers have hit it, fired at it, set its dogs on it and so on. These people had a, about 10 or 11 month old Mastiff dog and they went out and left it. And it was a friendly, happy thing. And while they were out, the house was burgled. And this fellow came in and he helped himself, and, you know, the dog just wagged its tail and greeted him. But when he went to go out of the door and take the stuff with him, it was a different matter. He wouldn't let him out. So when he tried to get out, it knocked him flat and sat on him, which was fine. But the only thing is, one side of him was up against the electric fire. <laughs> and he got quite badly burnt. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> they like that, you know, best yeah. if they don't bite, but they just stop you with their, their size and their, um, you know, their voice. All the Mastiff breed, they look right through you and you know they mean business. That is a wonderful testament to their self-discipline, their desire to think for themselves, think the thing out. And having a dog that thinks for itself and just doesn't bark out of fear or bark out of uh, an attempt to be a deterrent, but a dog that looks, assesses the situation and says, I don't have to charge this time, but if he harms my family, I will. Wonderful presence, not just because of their size, although the grandeur of a big dog is undeniable, prided the world over and revered the whole world over, the word mastiff itself, having a certain connotation for strength with discipline and control. If you go to the noble houses of Britain, you can find records of there being mastiffs on the premises. Whether they're mastiffs at Chatsworth or at Lime Hall or indeed Nostal Priory, probably at 20, 30 stately homes. I think, too, though, it, it would be wrong to think that they were the modern breed of Mastiff. They would have been Mastiff-like dogs, bred to a certain conformation. They would not have been yard dogs or 
canine burglar alarms. They would have been active, good-looking dogs that the owner would be proud of. We must think of the Mastiff, if we relate honestly to its heritage, as a heavy hound, a big, strong, strapping hound. And the first chapter of The Master of Game, one of the earliest books on hunting, one of the first lines is, a Mastiff is a manner of hound. The history of Mastiff type dogs is extremely long. There's a lot of romance in Mastiff history, a lot of romance. You hear the stories of Sir Piers Lee and his Limehall Mastiff at Argon Court and how she stayed by his side. They went into battle with their owners and fought alongside them because they were devoted to their owners. They've been used as uh, drover dogs, they've been used in war, they've been used as guardians. They've served man in many different ways. They're a giant breed of dog that have so much power and grandeur and yet their sole purpose in life seems to be that they want to please their owner, to be with their owner, to do everything that they can to make the owner feel protected and comfortable. My Mastiffs want to be with me. They, they, they don't want to be the dog in the backyard or in the most comfortable spot in the house. They want to be with me. If I'm, if I'm sitting in the, in the freezing cold wind, they'll be out there with me. If I'm sitting in the most comfortable spot in the house, they'll be very happy to be with me there too, but just part of everything I do, they want to be there. You walk around your own home and your mastiff is there, it's behind you, it's sitting next to you, it's laying on your feet. It has its head on your lap. When, when you look into a Mastiff's eyes, you see the unconditional love and you do see into their soul and it's gentle and it's caring and it's kind. It has that temperament and it has that ability to be able to, to sense that um, someone perhaps may be, be unwell and um, they enjoy to be patted and stroked, uh, and they're just incredibly gentle. So I think they make really, really good um, pattern and therapy dogs. They definitely love the interaction of the family. They see themselves as, as being part of the family, and they're probably one of the best family dogs around. They're very tolerant of uh, children and what children tend to do to uh, dogs at times. Mastiffs actually teach the children a calmness, a gentleness. My children have looked on the Mastiff for so long as family members. They seem to relate to the dogs. And children that can hold a love for an animal in their heart for a long time, it's, in my opinion, a good kid. I think, I think my children learned that when they're around Mastiffs, they should always have a slobber cloth nearby. <laughs> Silent forbearance, stoicism, and largeness of approach to life, bigness of personality. This is what I admire about them. The soul of the Mastiff is such that one moment, you know, they, they will defend their owner until the death. 
and then they will go home and play with the owner's children with a gentleness that has been written about for centuries. There's an automatic protectiveness that mastiffs develop towards family members. They stay very close to the house. They are extremely protective of young children. A mastiff will protect its owner without training, without aggression. They don't need to be aggressive. When you hear a big male mastiff bark, on hearing that anybody who continued to attempt to break into a house, in my opinion, would be a fool. But having said that, a mastiff isn't an aggressive breed. If somebody did break into the house, they're not going to attack them, but they're not going to allow them to leave. They will keep them there until the owners return. My experience is that mastiffs are very, um, very wary of, of strangers. They, uh, in general, don't go running up and, and jump all over you and say hi. They, they, they tend to, to stand back and, and observe. Mastiffs use a certain amount of reason and intellect before they react. They're not attack dogs. They're not used for that. They know property boundaries. Many mastiffs don't even have fences on their properties and they know exactly where the boundaries lie. One story about their protection ability and their sheer stoicism comes to me from a colleague of mine who ran a security firm in Glasgow. And one day he was talking to a, an old lady who lived on the edge of a big housing estate where drugs were rife. And when they were desperate for, for money to buy drugs, the druggies would kick in her door and she was terrified. So he said, look, I'll leave the old bull master with you a couple of nights to give you a bit of reassurance. One night after the dog had been going there for six nights, a druggie smashed home her door so loudly she got frightened and stop thinking and open the door to see what was going on and the young person desperate to get money to buy drugs pushed her out of the way and went into the room after a while he spotted this big dog staring straight at him didn't bark he then decided that he didn't want to be there and tried to leave the room the bull mastiff took three steps and seized his shoulder and pinned him to the ground. The lady got a neighbor to call the police. The police came, the dog would not let go. The chap had picked up um, a soda siphon and smashed it over the bull mastiff's head. The dog later needed nine stitches. The dog didn't let go. My colleague who owned the dog was called up by the police. He came round, the dog let go immediately and was taken to the vet. At no stage, did the dog attempt to savage him. At no stage did the dog even dream of letting go, even though the dog's blood was running into its eyes, into its nose, and all over the carpet. Now, terrible circumstances, but that sums up for me the Mastiff's ability and the, the breeds that derive from it, their ability to protect you come hell or high water. personal courage, magnanimity of temperament. But in the end, how stoic are they? And I once said to a policeman who was using a German Shepherd dog as a protection dog, who would you rather be guarded by? A shepherd or a professional at the job? And he went very quietly. My stud book records begin 
in the 1850s. I'm fairly certain the Kennel Club opened in around 1846. That would be when they became officially recognised, but pedigrees do go back prior to that time. And the Old English Mastiff Club was formed and was recognised by the Kennel Club, and that's when they um, drew up the actual breed standard. But the Old English Mastiff Club, it's began in 1883. It would be one of the oldest dog clubs in the world. It has gone on continually. They had their centennial show in 1983, which was so well attended. The Old English Mastiff Club, in my opinion, and, and as far as I know, would have the most valuable collection of, of trophies. And to see them is just quite, quite stunning. When I first became involved with the breed, the trophies were presented at the annual general meeting and as a novice person going to my first annual general meeting, the thought of I'm going to win one of those one day <laughs> was just great. And yes, it happened. I won the beautiful gold cup and the 30 guinea cup and we're talking about these beautiful ornate cups in, in silver and, and gold. America's most prestigious show is Westminster. The first Westminster show took place in 1877, which was a bench show. 25 Mastiffs were entered, and with 25 Mastiffs being entered, shows how popular the breed was at that time. I guess the breed is not for someone who wants to show on a regular basis and aiming for, for top awards. The, the, the Mastiff, sadly, just doesn't have that showmanship about it, in general, um, to compete for, for those awards. No, they're not natural showmen. They're usually bored out of their minds, <laughs> and it shows. If you've got a, a showman in the, in the breed, something that stands up and sparkles, it's such a benefit. But most of them just go, Ugh. The Mastiff must be able to move in a powerful way. It should have good strong front movement, good rear drive, a good top line, well angulated at the rear, not straight stifled the correct head, the correct temperament. It has to have type. You have to be able to say that that is a Mastiff and not scratch your head and wonder what breed it is or hang on, maybe is that a Bull Mastiff? It has to strike you as being, being a Mastiff. It's important that the construction of the dog is, is correct. Uh, I, my, in my opinion, um, poorly constructed animals uh, pass that through generation after generation. So many of them now are kept in kennels, not exercised, not stretched as they should be, if you get a kennel that has plenty of space for them to exercise, owners that take them for decent, proper long walks, yes, you'll get some that have got stamina and, and go all day, but so many of them have lost it. They've lost that ability. Big dogs look better when they move soundly, and a Mastiff that moves really well is such an impressive sight. And then to look at a dog that is out of breath and unable to move with uh, strength and purpose is sad. 
The worry for me about show dogs is dogs carrying a great deal of bulk with underdeveloped muscles who are clearly unfit. That's a betrayal. A big dog needs fitness more than any small dog. The pursuit of great bone and the commenting on it in show critiques of great bone, massive bone, is not wise. Nature is clever at providing the bone any animal needs to, for it to move correctly. Massive bone is of no help because if you cut through the leg bones of any animal, they're all hollow in the middle. And so if they're too hollow in the middle and they've got great weight, they're not giving you strength anyway. If you look at racehorse owners, they don't pursue massive bone, they pursue strong flat bone. And I can't see why a dog that's required to be a hound or a hound type, respecting its ancestry, should need or benefit from massive bone. Good muscularity, yes, but not massive bone. If you want to prevent skeletal disorders in any breed, whether it's a Mastiff or St. Bernard or, or whatever, is to stop breeding for size. Stop breeding for great bone, as the awful phrase goes. Breed for soundness. If out of soundness you get big dogs, that's a benefit. But a big, heavy, ponderous, short-lived, sickly dog is really insults man's intelligence. We're supposed to be above those sorts of things. We are the superior species. But if you only breed to win, if you only breed because you want your dog to be heavier than the next guys, or you want to show off your dogs because of their size, not because of their capability, there's something seriously wrong there in the logic of what you're doing. The Mastiff of England was a smaller, stronger, more athletic dog until the 1880s and onwards, when some breeders, and it happened in other breeds, I'm not just uh, pointing a finger at the Mastiff breeders, they decided to look for stature, substance, bulk if you like, and in came the blood of Alpine Mastiffs, of Tibetan Mastiffs, and Great Danes of dubious pedigree. And certainly in two world wars, the Mastiffs in England have suffered enormously in numbers and needed outcrosses and infusions of blood from abroad to re recreate the breed, if you like. There were only two Mastiffs left in England after the war. The end of the First World War, again, that, that had the Mastiff on the verge of extinction then. When you have two world wars, doing this to a breed of dog. Type changes, everything changes. A lot of the dogs through the wars were sent from England to America to save them because people couldn't afford to feed them while the wars were on and many, many dogs were put to sleep simply because there wasn't enough food. I think it was that the war went on that uh, things got worse and worse. Uh, there wasn't just mastiffs, all the large breeds were put down. In 1940, I was at boarding school um, up near Biggin Hill here uh, in Kent. And I, my parents used to come at the weekends to take me out 
on a Sunday afternoon and I can remember we were walking somewhere in the country and we went into this field and the forest there was this enormous mountainous pile <coughs> of dead dogs. Sorry I can still remember it. And that's what happened to them. Spoiled my Sunday afternoon that did. ones that were lucky enough, that were owned by people wealthy enough, that were sent to America, it was those bloodlines that came back after the war and helped re-establish the Mastiff in England. Because there were not very many American dogs still alive in America, but there were enough to, to start again. Animals of that size, whatever their dog or whatever else, they suffer unless they're part of the agricultural scene. Big pets in wartime don't come to the top of the list. And so the Mastiffs have done well to recover from two world wars, but it, it's worth remembering that it's from a very tiny genetic base and that needs to be taken into account. It's quite interesting to go to a Bull Mastiff show and then go to a Mastiff show and see the smaller elements of the Mastiff and the shorter faced Mastiff being almost possible entrants in the Bull Mastiff ring. And I think the Bull and Mastiff were so favoured, not just by gamekeepers, but by certain breeders like Leadbitter in Britain, um, that that bull head often crops up, but to me, looking from the outside, looking in at the breed, it is not a real Mastiff head. The Mastiff head is, in, in all the depictions I've seen, is not a bull head. It doesn't have any sign of the bulldog head, the more brachycephalic head. And I think it's a pity when you see blocky-headed dogs being rewarded and becoming champions. The furrowed dog, the wrinkled dog, it almost to me hints of bloodhound blood coming through. I don't object to that, but if you want type, you have to assure yourself that the type is really what you want in the breed. And when the bloodhound blood comes through, or indeed the alpine mastiff blood comes through, are you losing type? What should we be breeding back for if we love our mastiffs? And the head is often the key to this because it's the most easily spotted feature when variations come in. A long textured coat is spotted, pied coat is spotted, but the changes in head can be quite steady and subtle and over generations, not, they don't suddenly appear. However careful a kennel is, and however much they decry um, heavy coated ones, unless they're very lucky, they'll get the odd one cropping up. Where once they throw back even further, like the pieds, are probably, you know, rare. But the heavy coated ones of the St. Bernard's are, are too close up to the present day to um, avoid altogether. Mm -hmm. You're going to get them in any line. Genes act in a random way, never in a mathematical way. And although you may not want to have the longer coat, you can breed that out. But when you have a colour coming through that is not standard or would be called by kennel club registration departments as non-standard, I think that's not actually historically accurate. There is plenty of pied ball and white colour in the Mastiff gene pool and in the Bulldog gene pool. And if you look at the portrayals of Mastiffs by Birk and Gilpin and so on, they're mainly white, the Mastiffs.
I think that in the Mastiff gene pool, white has been buried. And in my view, directly you start restricting the colors in a breed, you're restricting the gene pool, you're not recognizing things which crop up, not by freak, but because they're in the gene pool. The breed standard doesn't allow it, and I do believe that a lot of people have had pied puppies that have been put to sleep as soon as they've been born. Why the pied was written out of the standard, I honestly don't know. I think it's a shame that it was because you can see some stunning pied mastiffs. A famous bloodhound breeder found a white pup in the, uh, in the litter and he put it in the bucket, said this, this is a freak. When he knew more about his business later on, he realized that white had always been in blood hands, although it was extraordinarily rare that it manifested itself. And he had put to death a source of genetic diversity which should have been welcomed in that breed. And he later wrote that he regretted it all his life. If you revere the ancestry of your dog, you welcome every component. You can't exclude some components, and you'd be very foolish to from the gene pool, because it's a sign that old diversity is working its way through, and that's a sign of strength, not something to be falsely accused of the result of crossbreeding or impurity or anything else. It is mastiff purity. Now, I am not a breed purist. I believe dogs are more important than breeds. And if at some stage the Mastiff needed to be outcrossed to another breed for the best interests of the Mastiff, I would never oppose that. It's the progeny that are important. And I don't believe there's any sense in perpetuating a tiny gene pool if you're producing sickly dogs, dogs that are not sound, dogs that don't lead a long and full life, and where you haven't got their well-being at heart. They have changed quite a lot of the physical conformation. Whether they've changed the character of the breed, I doubt, because that's harder. His character was enormous, but then I guess many Mastiffs have this, this huge, huge character and personality and very much his, his own, own sort of dog. They've got a lot of uh, his personality and his temperament from his father, Max, and I feel that um, Bear has passed that down to his own offspring. It's a breed that's been on the verge of extinction twice. And even through using crosses to bring them back, this character has been there all through. They've never lost their character. He really enjoyed living here, the way he could uh, roam around his and patrol his his little boundaries and uh, would go off and visit prince the clydesdale and have a little chat through through the fence very much loved the couch and if he could get on that bed with um, head on the pillow then then he certainly would it was just a, a wonderful character and was lovely to have spent the time with him 
Well, nobody could understand if they haven't lived with a mastiff just how well protected and loved and comfortable you are with the mastiff. My favourite was probably Grobbit. He was just my friend. Grobby. Dozer was, he was the most beautiful. Mastiff was the most gentle nature. A love of life, a love of people. He just enjoyed every every minute that dog was alive he loved it and it was something else if you can show me a really big, sound, impressive Mastiff, I am delighted. It is worth going a long way to see. They are very devoted. They are great companions. And they uh, uh, certainly always want to be with the people that they love most. They're obedient in as much as they will do eventually what you want them to do. They're certainly not quick obedience. They won't rush to do what you think. They'll think about it for a minute or two. Mm -hmm. oh, all right, then I'll do it. But they're, <laughs> they're not exactly like a border collie when it comes to obedience. They are the most well-behaved, gentle souls that you could ever have living in your house. The only thing you really have to be careful of is tripping over them because they're always under your feet. But, and if they want to go in and out, your doors can take a bit of a battering for them dragging their paw down, telling you that they want to go outside. They, they can leave a few gouges in your doors, so be aware of that. Mastiff's obedient dog. Um, they can be. They do like to to please. Uh, Rebel has this terrible trait of uh, he gives it away when he's being naughty, because the naughtier he is, the faster his tail wags. I think Mastiffs want to be obedient <laughs> and most of the time they try really hard <laughs> but um, sometimes it just sort of gets the better of them and they just push the boundaries a little bit. I have to learn not to let the dogs get away with things because they, they do challenge me all the time <laughs> but that's probably my fault more than this. <laughs>